All right, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Welcome to the show. This is actually episode one of the Cold Dog Show. Um, today is November 8th, 2023. So today we got some good topics we're going to dive into. Um, we're going to be discussing the President Selfakir's trip to Cairo and how President Selfakir and President Sisi of Egypt are looking to resolve Sudan's conflict. We're going to look at... Um, Rwanda's new visa fee policy. Is this going to impact trade or promote cooperation between African countries? You'll hear what I have to say. And then we're going to look at uh, China's mining investment in Guinea. So this show, we're just going to provide analysis and commentary on contemporary political and economic events happening across Africa. We'll dab into global affairs. Um, we'll provide analysis on different things happening across the world, but also share an African perspective. So that's the objective. Um, Follow us on YouTube, uh, a call and doc. Um, follow us on Facebook, a call doc. Follow us on Twitter, a call and doc. Um, and then we're going to do a segment that I'm going to call Africa of the Week. So you tune into the end after you do this. So without further ado, let's get this party started. Okay, so uh, this is an interesting story. Um, it's a story that has to do with um, my home country, South Sudan. So um, South Sudan's president, uh, President Selfakir Mayardit, uh, he just recently returned from Cairo uh, from a trip to the Arab Republic of Egypt where he met with um, the president of Egypt, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. And some of the things that they discussed was um, cooperation between the two nations. Uh, South Sudan and Egypt have very good relations. This is the second time that the president has gone to Egypt. Um, but the key thing that they did discuss was the Sudan crisis. Um, for those that don't know, earlier this year, uh, in April, uh, war broke out in Sudan between the military, um, the Sudan Armed Forces, which is led by the chairperson of the Sovereign Council, uh, Burhan, and then the Rapid Support Forces, um, uh, Mohammed Hamdan Dugula, or, or AKA Hemeti. This thing has created a lot of problems in the region. Um, you see a surge of migrants in Sudan, it's also very crucial. and considering the proximity Egypt and South Sudan have to Sudan. I mean, Egypt is a northern neighbor, South Sudan is a southern neighbor. This is a big thing. So let's go through the story and then let's have a discussions on what this means for the region and some solutions. Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi on Monday met with visiting South Sudanese leader Salva Kiir in Cairo. The South Sudanese presidency said in a statement that the two leaders would discuss various issues related to joint cooperation between the two countries. Sisi and Kia's meeting comes just days after the resumption of talks between Sudan's warring sides in Saudi Arabia's Jeddah. The visit to Egypt comes less than six months since President Kia and several other leaders in the region met in Cairo to attend the Sudan Neighbors Summit which was convened to discuss ways to peacefully resolve the conflict in Sudan. The meeting, chaired by El Sisi, attracted leaders from seven countries that border Sudan, including South Sudan, Egypt, Chad, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Libya, and the Central African Republic. Both Sisi and Kia face upcoming elections in their respective countries. Egypt will hold its presidential vote this December, while South Sudan's first ever vote, in which Kia will run for the ruling Sudan People's Liberation Movement, is slated for late 2024. Okay, so in April of this year, conflict erupted in Sudan. And the conflict erupted between Burhan and Hemeti. So Burhan was a chairperson of the, the the Sovereign Transitional Council. And the Sovereign Transitional Council was the, you can say it, the transitional framework that came after the fall of Omar al-Bashir in 2019. So after the fall of Omar al-Bashir, a transitional government set up. And in this transitional government, it was a power sharing agreement between various parties, including the military, different political parties, and people in the political sphere of Sudan. At first, they had nominated uh, the prime minister, which at the time was Hamdok. Uh, Hamdok was later overthrown by Burhan in a coup. He later returned, but then he resigned. So there has always been tensions that have been brewing between uh, Muhammad Hamdan Dugala, also known as Hemeti. 
Now, Hamiti leads the Rapid Support Forces, and the Rapid Support Forces are a paramilitary force that uh, were used by the Bashir regime uh, in Darfur and across Sudan. And this paramilitary force, you can just call it, was militias. It's known as a militia. So Hamiti became the deputy of the Sovereign Transitional Council. Um, Hamiti was resisting absorption into the military, and this was being pushed by Burhan. And Burhan was essentially the president. He was the chairperson of the Sovereign Council. And at the same time, he led the army, the Sudan Armed Forces. So these tensions have been going on for a while, and this has plunged Sudan into chaos. Now Khartoum has been abandoned. Even the ruling party has left Khartoum. Uh, currently now, Burhan is in Port Sudan, uh, a port town in uh, northeastern Sudan. That's where the transitional capital is. So the significance of President Salfikir going to Cairo uh, is not new uh, because Salfikir himself no Sudan. Uh, for those of you that don't know, South Sudan seceded from Sudan in 2011. And President Salfakir is the first president of South Sudan. And before South Sudan, he was the vice president of Sudan. So he's well aware of Sudan, Sudanese politics. And he's been playing a role in trying to mediate talks between the different groups. And this has to go back that at the time, Sudan played a role in the current peace agreement that's being implemented in, in South Sudan in 2018. So it's in the interest of Kier to kind of find a solution because he himself as a regional player, uh, this conflict has affected his country. Now you see a surge of migrants that have come into Sudan. Uh, and the economic side, South Sudan relies on Sudan to export is crude. I mean, South Sudan, 90% of its economy is dependent on the oil sector. So that pipeline exports, it's the lifeline of the country, it's exporting almost the majority of the country's crude. All of the country's crooks, I would say that, and the majority of the economic lifeline. So he'd want to find a solution. And on top of that, from a security point of view, you don't want your neighbor to have crisis. When your neighbor has crisis, that insecurity can spill over into you. Uh, so in July, uh, President Kier traveled to uh, Cairo to meet with neighboring countries, and they discussed this. So, and this is the second try. And the push now is President Sisi of Egypt and President Kier want to be included in the peace process. They want to be, lead and play mediate, play a role in mediating because they believe that any solution should consider them as neighbors. And they're rightfully so for that. And because now the peace process that are taking place in Jeddah are led by Saudi Arabia. And so many regional and global powers have come to the forefront. Um, Saudi Arabia, UAE, many countries who are trying to find a solution. But Kier and Sisi believe that to find a sustainable solution, you need to engage the neighbors of Sudan. And you need to have a solution that's homegrown. And they know Sudan better than anybody else. And even President Kier has said it many times that I'm the best person to solve this conflict because I know all these people. I know the warring factions. I know the ruling cliques. I know all these different various political interest groups. And I would know how to deal with them. Because before there was something called the Juba Peace Agreement. This Juba Peace Agreement was an agreement between different Sudanese political parties and armed factions that took place in Juba under the stewardship of President Salfakir. And President Salfakir has been adamant in trying to find solutions to Sudan. Rightfully so, because Sudan is your neighbor. And you don't want your neighbor to be in chaos. Uh, yes, they've had historic challenges between South Sudan and Sudan, but they do that. But I think all in all, I want to call to attention when people talk about African solutions to African problems. And many Africans are starting to become much more cosmicant of how the lack of regional cooperation can sometimes destruct domestic politics. And what do I mean by that? In South Sudan, you see a surge in Sudanese coming to South Sudan. Uh, you see how this is affecting things on the border. So the way this peace process is solved, it's important that South Sudan it plays a role because South Sudan is directly impacted. The same thing you can see with Egypt. You're seeing a surge of Sudanese going to Egypt uh, to seek refuge. Um, so they believe that we should be included in this process, and rightfully so. And I think that many more African solutions should discuss this aspect. How do we include different stakeholders? How do we include different people? In, in this conflict, such as neighbors, such as regional power players. And it can't just be a process that's done in 
Saudi Arabia or done in Dubai or done in the US. It's a process that should involve the region. So that's what I have to say about that. But we hope that peace in, peace in Sudan can prevail. And we have to applaud the efforts of Egypt and South Sudan for trying to solve peace. But we'll continue to follow this story. We'll definitely be discussing this more. Uh, okay, so we finished with South Sudan. We're in Egypt. And we're going to go to um, Rwanda. So Rwanda just introduced a new policy where they're going to allow visas for all African countries. So it's going to announce a visa-free travel for all Africa. So basically, they're going to if you're an African country, you don't have to have a visa to enter Rwanda. So let's look at the story and let's discuss. Africans can travel visa-free to Rwanda as the East African nation becomes the latest on the continent to announce such a measure aimed at boosting free movement of people and trade to rival Europe's Schengen zone. Rwanda's president, Paul Kagame, made the announcement Thursday in Kigali, where he pitched the potential of Africa as a unified tourism destination. Any African can get on a plane to Rwanda whenever they wish, and they will not pay a thing to enter our country, Kagame said, during the 23rd Global Summit of the World Travel and Tourism Council. Once implemented, Rwanda will become the fourth African country to remove travel restrictions for Africans. Other countries that have waived visas to African nationals include Gambia, Benin and Seychelles. Kenya has also mooted the plan with President William Ruto announcing Monday it will allow all Africans to travel to the East African nation visa-free by December 31. The African Union in 2016 launched an African passport with much fanfare. However, only diplomats and AU officials have been issued the travel document. Okay. Um, I think this is a good step. Um, when you talk about visa-free policies in Africa. Um, Rwanda is now the fourth country in Africa that has basically announced removal of travel restrictions for Africans. So the other countries are Gambia, Benin, and Seychelles. And we just heard that the Kenyan president, William Ruto, President Ruto announced that Monday, all Africans who want to travel to Kenya will travel visa-free by December 31st. And so the AU says that the, the, the AU has launched a, a Africa continental free trade arena, and it's a continent-wide free trade arena estimated to be worth $3.4 trillion, which aims to create a single unified market for the continent's 1.3 billion people. Okay, so as, as you know, I mean, I really have a belief that these visa policies don't have an impact on the country because if you're a business person, you want to travel to a particular country, you'll make your way there. And many of the times when you want to travel across Africa, it's just a hassle. I mean, I'll tell you, um, with a South Sudanese passport, I've traveled to Ethiopia, Sudan, Egypt, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, South Africa, Nigeria, Morocco. Many of the times you have to get your visa in advance and many of the times you have to get, you have to go through a stringent visa process. But I think ceremonial, this is a positive gesture by uh, President Kagame to send a message to people that Rwanda is welcoming to all Africans, that Rwanda doesn't have a problem with any African. If you're an African, you want to come to Rwanda, you are highly welcome. And I think that's a positive gesture in in the spirit of Pan-Africanism, because sometimes these visa policies may be simple, but then there's a lot of immigration policies that are involved too, because you can get a visa. Let's say you have a visa, you go to a country, you stay there. But then when you get there to live there, to work there, you may need immigration, you may need work permits, you may need permanent residency. So I think the focus should be on how can we create a conducive environment for people living in the country, not letting people enter the country. So if you're an expat, if you're an African living in another African country, what are some hurdles that you face? Those are the hurdles that need to be addressed because I know in some countries that the visa or the entry is not the problem, but doing business there is a problem. Sometimes the policy is unfavorable. Sometimes the rules and regulations are not clear to the to the foreigners. So Rwanda has always had a business friendly environment. And I think that most African countries should be more open to African investors. And I always say, you don't have to necessarily get FDI. You can get investment from Africans themselves because there's Africans who have money. There's African banks, there's African financial institutions. There's a lot of Africans who have money, who have capital that are ready to invest 
in Africa. We need to identify those people and we need to encourage them to invest in Africa. And we need to encourage intra-Africa trade because our theme and our mindsets as Africans has been, we need to get FDI, we need to get investment from Europe, from America, from China, from the Middle East. But let's start looking internally. Let's start looking at ways to bring more internal African trade. Overall, I think this is a great policy. It's very ceremonial. Like I said, my position is that I don't believe it's going to be a big difference. Because, I mean, if you're somebody who uh, wants to do business, you'll get a visa, you'll get there. But I think the key should be, uh, Rwanda's good at this. I'm not say anything about Rwanda. Rwanda is very good at its internal policy in terms of business, but other African countries should be encouraged to have more transparent and more positive uh, internal business policies for African investors. All right, that's my take on that. All right, as we continue in Africa, this next story is an interesting story. Um, so this story is about China in West Africa. So China is currently developing um, the Simadu uh, iron ore mines. And so the Simidu is a 180 kilometer, uh, 68 miles mountain range in the forest of Southeast Guinea and is home to the world's largest known underdeveloped reserves of high grade iron ore. And so with the projected annual capacity of about 120 million tons, that's a lot. And so the vast deposits have been drawn by Chinese multinationals, including the world's largest steel producer, China Bau which recently signed a deal to develop the two blocks in the Simudu mine. So this is quite interesting because um, China is trying to reduce, reduce its reliance on Australia and trying to look at alternative mines. So let's look at the story and then discuss. China is progressing with the construction of a giant iron ore mine in the African country of Guinea, with the mine expected to be operational by 2025. Joining us now is business reporter Edward Boyd. So, Ed, what does this mean, this mine opening for Australia's iron ore industry? Well, what it means is when there is an increase in supply of any mineral, prices will come down. So for the Australian iron ore sector, it means you can expect iron ore prices to be a bit weaker once this giant mine in Guinea comes online. It's meant to come online in 2025. This has been a really long running project though. The iron ore was first discovered in the late 1990s by Rio Tinto and Rio Tinto have basically been working since then to get this mine up and running. And there's been a series of hurdles along the way. One of the biggest ones is the mine is located about 550 kilometres from the port. They need to build the port, they need to build a big railway line, then they need to build the mine itself. So it's going to be a very high cost operation. But just in the last couple of weeks, there's been some uh, developments with the project and the port is now under construction according to the Financial Review newspaper. So this mine is slowly going to get built. Um, China are a big partner in this mine. They're obviously looking to diversify buying iron ore, not just from Australia and Brazil, but they want to now buy it from the African nation of Guinea as well. So for China, mm. it means they need more supply and this mine's going to probably come online in the next few years. Okay, keep an eye on that one. Okay, so we saw what's going on in Guinea. So Guinea has a unique circumstance, as you know. If you've been following African politics, Guinea was one of the countries that I had a coup uh, in 2021, September 5th coup, and it overthrew the government at Alpha Conde. So I'm going to analyze this from three levels. We're going to look at the political, the economic, and then the social level. Um, as you listen to the interview, when you have a situation where you are building railroads, you're building a port, and you're building an entire industry, you're going to create thousands of jobs for people. And in a country in, in, in a country that just had a coup and is looking for to tackle some of these economic challenges, because what prompted the military to take over the coup was economic situation, the political situation. So let's start with the economic side. Uh, Guinea has the potential to become the second largest exporter of iron ore and it's currently the second largest producer of bauxite, the ore need to produce aluminum, but then it can become the fifth largest producer of iron ore in the world. That right there is significant, I mean, economically. So when they're saying that the, the, the hurdles to building, to developing the, the mine was that there was no ports, no railroads, 
and no infrastructure. Part of this project is these companies are building that infrastructure. Um, yes, it is Chinese, but they're building the infrastructure. Economically, this can have benefits to the people of Guinea. Let me just say that economically, it can bring money because by 2025, if this mine is developed uh, and money is coming to the government, this money is used to develop the country and improve the lives of the most vulnerable citizens, that's always a positive. But then now we have to look at the political. Everything is political. And here on this show, we always believe everything's political. There's always a political angle. We know the issue of China. We know the issue of the quote unquote neocolonialism of China. I myself believe that Africans have a right to deal who they want to deal with, but the failure of American policy is what prompted some of these things. China is taking a risk going to a country, developing infrastructure, and developing a mining sector from scratch. Dull arterial motive is obviously that they want to reduce their reliance on Australia. And that's, our, that's why I, uh, there, and if you listen, that's from Sky News. So Sky News Australia is the one who reported that's the source from their story. Because I wanted the Australians, uh, as, as, you, as you listen to the reporter saying that, when you have more mines, more of, of a product entering the market, you're going to see the prices go down. But when he talked about the challenges of developing this mine, this mine was discovered in the 90s. And it's going to be developed in 2025. I mean, you're looking at almost 30 years of potential. But who came and invested in that? It's the Chinese. You can disagree. You can agree with their tactics. You can call it neocolonialism. You can call it exploitation. Call it whatever you want. But they've invested in a place where people didn't want to invest. I don't see any American companies investing there. I don't see any European companies coming to invest. And the problem that many people have is that they say, well, this money is going to fund a military government. This money is going to go to benefit the military junta who overthrew a democratic elected government. Yes, th that's possible. That's the political angle. And that's what we're going to focus on. Contained to the political angle, there's a social angle to this that concerns a lot of people. If you're somebody who's an environmentalist, you're somebody who's, um, let me say, an activist, your concern is going to be the health, safety, and environmental implications of such projects. You're right. That's a concern. I myself, I, I wrote this down. Okay. How many people's lives are going to be impacted by these mines? How many people's lives are going to be impacted by the railroads? How many people's lives, land, water, ecosystem? What is that impact? I think it's fair for Africans. Anytime we do these projects, yes, we're going to have this, but what's the impact? You're looking at a construction of a 650 kilometer railroad. That's a long distance. How many people's, how can that impact the ecosystem of Guinea? You're developing a port. And we know the mining industry is a very dirty industry, so to speak, dirty in the sense that there's a lot of pollution and environmental challenges. What is that impact going to be on the people of Guinea? And has the government of Guinea heeded to that? That's something that we have to ask. Those are some considerations that people are going to have. Have they considered that? Is this going to impact the livelihoods of the people of Guinea? With any situation where we have this push going towards clean energy, this push of reducing carbon footprint, there's a conundrum that takes place in Africa that many of us fail to understand. It's that African countries have to balance between balancing their financial books, running their governments, and the environment. That's the reality you have to accept because if you decide tomorrow we need to shut down all oil all production, minings, all this, where are they going to get their revenues from? If you have countries that rely most of their revenues on these natural resources, where are they going to get their funding from? They're not going to get it from anywhere. And you don't see people coming and investing in clean energy in Africa. So it goes to the point that uh, let's focus on the political. Economically, we've already said that this can have a lot of, this can bring a lot more money for it. The political, number one, these people are working with the military junta. Why should they do that? I mean, many people can ask. Number two, has the, mil has the government and the ruling military junta heeded to the environmental concerns of the people? Are they going to be relocated? Is it going to be compensation? Those are questions you got to ask. 
finally, is this an extension of China's new colonial policies? Is China really trying to cement itself? Do you believe that China is investing in Africa? Or do you believe China is exploding? So share your thoughts with us on this story. All right, guys, I, we're at the end of the show. Thank you for tuning in. We got to go through um, what's happening in Sudan through the president of South Sudan trip to visit the president of Egypt. And we'll definitely keep following that story. I mean, right now we're really wishing that their peace prevails in Sudan and we really want peace to prevail in Sudan. So we want the different various factions to come to an agreement. Um, you prefer a political settlement in any instance than a military settlement. Military settlement doesn't nobody any justice. Um, so we really hope that that ends out well. Uh, we applaud the president of Rwanda Kagame for the visa-free policy. Great step. I mean, I say it's largely ceremonial, but um, we need more leaders in Africa to replicate that, to create a more conducive environment for Africans and internal investment policy. I think that's be a good segment, discuss investment policy. But anyways, um, we'll keep following the Guinea mining sector. I think that's quite an interesting thing. Um, and I think we really want to see how that's going to definitely play out. Should be an interesting one. Um, so as always, this is we're going to get your full shows on Thursdays. You get full shows. And then throughout the week, you'll just get different analysis, different reactions to what's happening. I'm seeing that there's going to be some interesting things happening, especially as we approach the American elections next year. So there's going to be a lot of content, a lot of things we're going to be discussing. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, but I want to close the segment with giving a shout out. I'll say um, shout out of the week or African of the week for me. This time I want to give it to um, uh, Francis Ngume. Uh, uh, I said his name right. Well, uh, so he I mean this is a guy who's a MMA fighter, Nagu, uh, who gets in the ring with Tyson Fury. Should have won. Screwed over. We all know it. We all know how you feel. He was screwed over. He should have won. But the grit and determination to get in a ring the first time in a boxing bout and you know like i don't want to get into the details but crossover and especially between mma and boxing there's been a debate can boxers maintain can mma maintain but the last time you saw something like this with with um conor mcgregor so you all remember so it's quite interesting that he did that and i think it shows to the grid and he really and you had a lot of africans tuning in and following that fight it was so beautiful i mean he really lifted our heads up high so shout out we goes to francis um as always, uh, please like, subscribe, share on social medias, um, follow us, and let's keep rock and roll. So you guys take care. Have the rest, good rest of your day, wherever you are listening to the world. I'm out.